today, ASAP 19 by Dr. Nathaniel Schlicker. We've actually had a running joke going off and on the fact that uh, it seems though that neither of us has really terribly exciting names um, that how everybody uh, messes them up. And we were talking about even going through this entire podcast calling different names the, the entire time. But for the sake of your sanity, uh, we'll keep it uh, pretty simple. But he's in here today. He's from Washington, uh, not only emergency physician, uh, but also has, has had his foray in, uh, in politics as well, in, including his JD and, and, and a little bit of a, a little bit around in the Senate, state Correct. Senate. And um, he was going to come to talk to us today about a little bit of advocacy and then roll that into a little bit of wellness and purpose. So uh, give us a little info on your background because it is there is a unique background that brings a comp- a pretty different angle and viewpoint of emergency medicine. <laughs> Well, thanks, uh, Dr. Stan, for being here. Uh, Always great to chat with you about uh, the various lives we live in emergency medicine. And I think advocacy is one of those other things that uh, people do. Uh, And my background was, you know, I was a pit doc working in the ER right out of residency. And I'd always been involved in advocacy. And Mm -hmm. my chapter, you know, had a legislative advisor position. And they said, hey, you like that advocacy thing, right? You should come and be our chair. And I said, ah, I've done the EMRA, you know, legislative advisor, I need a break. They said, don't worry, we're a sleepy chapter. You know, nothing ever happens here in Washington. Go to two meetings, you'll be fine. And so reluctantly, I agreed. And six months later, during the Great Recession, the state came up with the brilliant idea that we're going to solve the budget problems by just not paying for care. Still require you to see them, still re- say that patients need care, but we just aren't going to cover the bill for what are the most vulnerable patients in our population. And so uh, being a young, naive, excitable uh, uh, post-residency new attending, I said, we can fix this. And we went to battle with the state, spent a couple of years, a lawsuit that we won against the state, and uh, came up with what became known as the seven best practices. And out of that, I spent so much time in the legislature, they decided to ask me to uh, serve in office. And so I ended up running for and getting appointed to the state senate. Uh, running in, uh, serving uh, for a year, and then running in the most expensive race in the history of the state at that point. Uh, losing gloriously uh, by two points, but uh, an amazing experience on the other side of the wall, uh, so to speak. Well, so let's talk to this about the importance of advocacy and then seeing it from both sides. We'll talk about some of the things you can and can't do, should and shouldn't do, because we've actually talked about it some in terms of you know, things we, we can do to help our cause and things we can do to hurt our cause uh, as well. So uh, talk about that importance as you sitting here now representing state senator. Um, talk to us about the importance of, of the advocacy of having people active and coming and seeing you. It's so important. You know, remember, there are not that many elected officials in your state, and there may be nobody in health care that's actually worked in health care. Or maybe you've got a nurse mm-hmm. or a pharmacist or a hospital administrator, but they don't understand necessarily what it's like to care for patients. And so somebody becomes the lead on health care that may have no knowledge or interest in health care. When I was there in the state Senate, I remember uh, we were discussing a tough issue about access to uh, Plan B for rape victims. And uh, there was a senator who was a senior senator who was railing that in Catholic hospitals in Washington, they don't do that. And I was the junior senator, and generally you're supposed to be quiet. And I gently raised my hand and said, well, ma'am, I I work at a Catholic hospital as an ER doctor, and we give Plan B to rape victims all the time, ma'am. She said, that's not true. I said, that's literally my job, ma'am. And, you know, so it was amazing to watch that there are beliefs that happen that are predicated on misinformation and that if you're not there to correct that and bring evidence and reality those will be what persists and oftentimes there is one or two people that may be the subject matter expert and so influencing them and influencing your legislator to have a little bit of knowledge on the key issue so they can ask the tough questions helps make sure that the facts the truth and hopefully the right answer comes out of it right now we're dealing with probably one of the biggest issues uh, facing the nation's emergency medicine uh, in quite some time from a federal politics standpoint, that being the out-of-network billing fight, and with numbers of the pushing of potential cuts to reimbursement of 30-plus percent, which would be catastrophic for many uh, hospitals and groups, and especially those critical access that that aren't running a huge margin uh, by any stretch of the imagination to begin with. How is it, in, in one, what are some of the strengths we have in those discussions 
and then then two why why do you have to why does it need to be kind of across the board instead of a couple of vocal such as in the state situation more a more a global approach to it as opposed to uh, just a couple of people speaking on behalf well I think this is an example of one of those issues where it's so critical that we wear the white hat because oftentimes this is characterized by insurers as being all about money Mm -hmm. greedy wealthy physicians just out to protect their paycheck and gouge poor suffering patients and oh by the way they leave out the part about they're not signing contracts and they're deliberately pushing physicians out of network they leave out the fact that we generally you know in most states upwards of 98 to 99 percent of our patients are in network in fact uh and so that this is a small part and they leave out the fact that the, many of these cases that they're talking about are not actually balanced billing. They're surprise bills, as in people were surprised at how poor their insurance coverage was. In our own state, we negotiated a settlement last year with the state to do a reasonable bill. But when the insurance commissioner brought their witnesses to talk about the horrors and the plight mm -hmm. of balanced billing, the three witnesses they brought, neither of them had a balanced bill in Washington. One had a balanced bill in Hawaii, one had an ambulatory outpatient elective balance bill that they knew about but were just upset about how much it was, and the other one was just surprised at how bad their coverage was. I mean, when the other side's fighting with nothing resembling the facts, it's so critical that we're there to provide that information, uh -huh. provide that context, and say, look, we're the ones wearing the white hat. We serve everybody 24-7, 365. We're the ones that are taking care of the uninsured and have been long before the ACA came out in many states where there wasn't Medicaid expansion, still doing 10, 20, 30 percent of our business without reimbursement. We're the only specialty that that's asked of. And so I think it's critical that we're there to provide that context that this is about patients, this is about access, this is about doing the right thing. And if we only talk to one or two people making the decision, you have to hope that they believe what you believe. If you can help educate every legislator, then you have an army that is constantly saying, you know, I keep hearing something else and it doesn't make sense to me what you're mm -hmm. saying. And that's what we need is that pushback from their peers to say, we're having this conversation behind closed doors today. Tomorrow I might be out there opposed to you. Let's figure this out today. What's amazing is that the false information, the false narrative that was provided without the um, really nationwide response, many of these folks in Washington still would assume that we are balanced billing 25% of our cases, that we're purely doing it for uh, profit pur purposes, that it's only uh, the certain larger organizations that are, pro that are causing this issue, and it wouldn't impact the smaller hospitals at all, uh, or the smaller groups. And, you know, going up there and providing that information, providing that data, showing them the numbers and everything else, it goes miles because as soon as they can see that they were sold a bill of goods, mm -hmm. um, that, that a lot of the data they were given was completely false, then it, then it really falsifies the vast majority of the argument. And you can see that change now with the, how much that's been backed off the initial legislation, shifting towards the um, ASAP and many organizations supported legislation that has the independent arbitration uh, included within it. And now you see the timing where something was going to happen by uh, end of summer and we're now um, at the time of recording here at the very end of October. And we see that everything for the most part at the moment seems to, to have backed off uh, quite a bit. And I think the one thing that we have that, um, that the other organizations in, in, in terms of the insurance companies and uh, those other groups is we have representation in every single congressional district in this country. We have folks that can talk to every single congressperson about this issue because we are impacted. We are their constituents and our, it's our health care as well. Um, so being able to talk to them about them does a huge, uh, that, that goes a very long way in terms of straightening out the narrative, making sure that we're in the right direction and they understand what the heck is going on. So we have to have, you know, a few folks that we have that we can go and do those discussions and have things, but also that we have doctors all over this country willing to make those conversations with, um, with each of their legislators to make sure that they're on the same page and know what's going on and know what they want and why it's important to protect access to care and to protect the patients in their district. And I, I feel like they, that, that they respond pretty well to that. Doesn't mean they're gonna make a great decision uh, all the time, but it, I, I think that's got, that has the best chance and a lot more power than just having a large corporation, though they have a lot of money coming in and, and dictating. Definitely, I mean, there's an old saying in politics, you're always safe when you vote your district. It's why even though I you know, live in a democratic district, my democratic uh, state uh, congressional leader 
we're also a military district, and so we voted for military funding all my childhood growing up, which mm-hmm. was not necessarily popular in the 80s and 90s. For a Democrat, totally popular, but it was allowed to vote your district because you were voting for what benefited your constituents. And I think what you said is so true, is we represent the constituents, we are their constituents, and we care for their neighbors. And there's nothing like telling the story of somebody that you've cared for, about how they've been act, you know, impacted by this issue, about how they've struggled to get access because of bad insurance, not because of surprise billing. To tell the story about your local group mm-hmm. or the part of the national group that you're part of, whichever it is, about what your billing practice is, so you can bring them real numbers. When we went down and testified this year, the insurance commissioner actually had the audacity to stand up and say, we did a claims review and we looked at the data and it was some 20% of all bills were balanced bill in Washington. And we looked at each other and we said, we've done that internal work. We've gone to the groups and gotten data and mm-hmm. we had it at less than 2%. In fact, when you looked at it, it was about less than 0.3% had a bill exceeding $250 coming out of an emergency department. And about a week later, they rolled back and said, you know, we kind of messed up on a decimal point on that one. It is about 2%. You're right. And that's the kind of thing that is so important that we're telling the story, telling what we do, telling about the patients that are impacted, and putting the human face on it. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the greedy doctors versus the greedy insurance companies, but it's the neighbors, it's the friends caring for our neighbors, caring for our constituents. And I think that has the power to make great change and allow people to vote their district, whether or not that's the party line, whether or not that may be what some special interest is telling them. They vote their district and they vote for the constituents. They're still going to be fine. They're still going to get reelected and you're going to be there to support them. And you, if you notice that, you know, you got there's an end. Um, there's an end on each side that they're safe no matter what, because that district is so red or so blue that it's, it's not going to go anywhere. And they're, you know, they can vote their party line, but just like in the national elections, where you're fighting really about a five to ten percent margin at most, everybody else has already decided. And, but it's it's that sway voter that you're looking for. In this case, you do have those that are in districts that are vulnerable. They could potentially lose that next election, and so being able to come there and talk to them about that and convince them, we don't have to convince them all. We just have to have the ones that get us past fifty plus one. Uh, exactly. to get to get to those numbers Let's well and uh, one thing i'd add on there is that we forget that many issues are not partisan mm-hmm. and this is one of those ones it's not really fundamentally partisan there's not a correct republican and a correct democrat position on this yeah. so we're trying to sway both sides of it and even in those locked in safe districts we're trying to educate them to what is good for their constituents and many issues in politics. When I was in the Senate and, you know, ended up having the contest with my housemate, we went through and did the analysis. We voted the same way on 86% of the bills that were signed into law. You know, we're opposite parties, obviously. So many issues are bipartisan. This one is one of those. That's why it got such great traction this summer was that everybody said it was a problem. So there's not a correct partisan answer, I think, on this. What we need to do is convince them about the correct medical answer to this. And that's where I think we have the power. So let's talk about some of those tools. Some of the things, again, now you're back in your uh, state senate seat again, and you've got physicians coming to talk with you. What are the things that we're going to do that are going to help our cause, and what are the things we're going to do that are going to hurt our cause? I think the helping is easy. It's bringing stories. Tell the stories of your patients. Tell the stories of the impact that you see, of the good work you're doing, wearing the white hat. If you do that, I think, you know, that pulls on the heartstrings. And we like to think in facts as physicians. We Mm -hmm. think of evidence-based medicine. There's no such thing as evidence-based legislating. Uh, It is an emotion-driven sport. And so if they can remember the individual that they've seen, Mm -hmm. that they've heard about, that will carry more weight than all the pie charts and graphs you can bring. It's important to have good data. But don't lead and win with your data because it's not going to do it. And most importantly on that is also recognize that you can be right, but it doesn't mean you're correct. And that means that the facts can be on our side, but that doesn't mean that you go in, walk in, wearing your white coat and say, I have arrived to educate you lowly people about the truth about medicine. Drop on them your fact book and walk out saying, I have done my work and solved my problems. This is an emotion game, which means it's also a relationship game, which means you're not going in there. Maybe they're going to say, you know what, I'm not interested. My good buddy's one of the insurance guys and, you know, runs, you know, pick your large insurance company, Aetna, and uh, I just can't, can't see it your way. 
Don't get mad. Don't get angry. Don't make accusations. Say, well, thank you so much for meeting with me. I'd love to continue this conversation. Here's my card. When healthcare issues come up, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You know, here's my cell phone. It's on there. You know, and be a resource. So go in there with that open mind. Think of it as a relationship. Don't preach, but educate. And then work to build a long-term relationship because just going in once, legislators are like ER doctors. They have appointments every 15 minutes. And what you're trying to do is be the one memorable 15-minute appointment from that day. Mm -hmm. If you can do that and come back again and not be a frequent flyer, but enough that they know you and want to see you again, then I think you've made your impact no matter what the outcome is on that specific issue. So what are the things we're going to do that are going to turn that – to turn that legislator off? What are the things that we may do coming in there that, that are going to make it go not our direction? Other than just the, all the pie charts. All the pie charts, yeah. No, definitely the pie charts. Uh, I think one of the big things is don't be offended if you end up meeting with their legislative aide, uh, especially at the national level. And since where we're seeing a lot of the balance billing issue play out is at the national level, a lot of legislators have a lot of issues, and you're going to meet not necessarily with them. ASEP does a great job when we're here uh, for leadership and advocacy in D.C. of getting us into those offices. But probably about half of those meetings are actually with the member. Mm-hmm. The staff, though, is the one that helps guide the decision and makes the change. So meet with the staff. Talk with the staff respectfully. Don't be upset that you've not met with the member. Build a relationship with that staff member. Send the staff member a thank you card, equally as much as the member. You know, if you can do those things and see that as a personal relationship, you're going to go a long way with them. If you're rude to the staff, it's like being rude to the secretary at your residency visit. The secretary has a few strike votes when they come to rank and slots. Same rule applies in Congress. There are certain things that you don't want to do. I think other things that you see a lot of uh, is people is stretching the truth or lying, maybe even. If they don't know the answer, they don't want to seem like they don't know the answer. Mm-hmm. But I look at it much like when you're rounding in a hospital as a medical student. It's better to say, I don't know, than guess at it. Because they're pretty good at detecting BS, too, just like your attendings were. They'll kind of know. What you want to say is, hey, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but let me get back to you with that information. Not only have you been clear about where your honest ethical lines are with them, but you have also made sure that you've now got a reason to talk to them the second time in a week and build that relationship. So don't lie. Don't yell at them and be nice to the staff is probably three pretty good rules. Now, there's one other thing, because there was a discussion here in Denver about the white coat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my position was that if that if there's certain situations where it's applicable, especially some of the white hat issues where we're just going in to, you know, support um, car seats or something like that. I think that's very good. It's a very positive thing that they can go on. But is there points where the white coat could be something that's seen negatively by the politician. I think there can be, and we had a lot of that conversation on the floor of council this week, that you know, some people see it as a costume. They see it as kind of throwing it in their face. Uh, and remember that many legislators may come from areas where they don't have a large educational background, mm-hmm. and they may see it as you putting your credentials in their face. Power move. Exactly. Uh, You've got nothing on me as a congressman. You know, I'm the doctor, and I'm here to educate you. So, again, I think it comes down as much to your personality. And if you have a more luxury type approach to this, Mm -hmm. probably wearing the white coat is not going to emphasize the character traits that you want. If you're more of a congenial, friendly demeanor when you're talking about these issues, maybe the white coat is a resource to remind them that you are the professional. So, I think it takes as much looking inward at who you are and looking at who your audience is and making your best judgment about how is it going to be perceived that I'm wearing the white coat. I think there are times, like you said, when we're doing the white hat issues and we're in there to help our patients, probably nine out of ten times it's a good thing. This issue where it's a little bit more business trade profession type issue, Mm -hmm. I agree with you it seems a little bit more challenging and a little bit more confrontational than it does being helpful. But there are other ways to accomplish the same thing. Um, Many organizations uh, bring scarves so everybody has their scarf day so when you know the SEIU is on campus everybody has a purple scarf a little more subtle we did that as the state medical association one year and had WSMA scarves and some of the groups will then say and by the way I'd love to leave one here for you 
And so mm-hmm. I had like 30 scarves from different organizations by the time I left office. Uh, so there are subtle ways to say I'm here with a group and this is a group effort that aren't maybe as confrontational as wearing a white coat. And I think that's key is understanding that we have to gear our approach to completely on what we are actually talking about, what we're advocating for, the issue at hand. You know, it, it's very fluid. And, and I think the most important thing working with a couple of uh, my legislators with uh, with Brett Guthrie and Andy Barr, and uh, you know those are probably the two closest I work with from the federal level. Uh, but then uh, some of the, our senators and, and some of the others surrounding as well. It's really just the relationship as a friend, knowing that we can turn back and f- uh, forth. So, you know, especially with uh, Representative Barr, you know, we text each other back and forth all the time. You know, he asks me about certain things, and I just send a thought on things every once in a while. Um, open conversations. If they've got a questions, his office may call. You know, and building up those relationships, building up that trust, understanding that I'm not there to attack him, or as you mentioned, um, lecturing or educating. You know, that we're there to help each other. Yeah. That he has things that can help me, and I have skills that can help him. And you know, wherever that is, if they see that relationship, then that's what can really build up. And honestly, you know, working with the out-of-network billing in, uh, in multiple states over the last few months. You know, understanding the way that this discussion often may happen based on political parties and leanings. What do you focus on based on the key tenants and the platform on which they stand um, on each side? You focus on different things and, and, and you tell the story, the same story, but just a little bit different focusing on what they like, what they tend to have as their primary goals, going into, going into certain offices and talking about a certain thing in a certain way completely turn them off but you go in the next office on somebody who's on the other side of the aisle it may be exactly what they want to hear and so you can yeah. st- you can tell the exact same story you just have to understand who you're talking to and what the priorities of that party are and there's just as many variations among states north south east and west as well totally and i think that's exactly it you're appealing to their values and understanding that going in who they are what they value and party tells you some of that but knowing them enough to learn what their values are or googling them to figure it out mm-hmm. if you need to but you know, I mentioned the ERS for Emergencies program we created. But when I was advocating for that in the state and going to everybody that would listen, I think I visited something like 45 offices, Democrat, Republican, it didn't matter. And I was nonpartisan at the time. Nobody knew which party I belonged to. And I told the story that I'd go in and I would talk to Republicans and I'd say, look, I'm a small business owner and you, the government, are asking me to do work for free for the government. I mean, this is big government overreach. And that appeals to a base value of supporting small independent businesses mm-hmm. to Republicans. And I go into the Democrats and say, look, this is socially wrong. You're picking on a population that 80% of them have mental health and 40% of them have substance use disorder issues. And you're blaming the patient and trying to drive down their access to care. This is the vulnerable people we're supposed to be caring about. This is what you stand for. And it was that social justice message. Now, the policy outcome was the exact same thing, but it was filtered through the lens of their values right. so that they could hear the message. And I think all the things we do have to be filtered in that way. You got, have to know your audience. You know, and we know that as clinicians, and I think we do that with our patients. You know which ones you can joke with, mm-hmm. which ones you got to be serious with, which ones are hard, which ones are soft kind of approaches to challenges. We have to use that same skill set when we go into the legislature and read people the same way we do. And if you do that you'll be incredibly successful because that's a natural gift that most clinicians have is to be able to read another human being. Well, fantastic information. I, uh, I appreciate it. And I thought we were going to get to wellness and purpose, but we spent so much time on uh, Dove and got so many different angles of advocacy, getting into all those things and relationship building that uh, we rolled right through all of it. So it's fantastic. Well, it just means we'll have to find wellness another time. We'll do it another time. Uh, and how can <laughs> folks get in touch with you if they have any questions? Oh, you can always email me. Uh, my email is available online uh, in many places, but uh, the easiest is probably just Nathan at SchlickerConsulting.com. If you get Schlicker roughly right, it'll probably find it, but it's S-C-H-L-I-C-H-E-R. Uh, and uh, my cell is always available. Uh, on, it's on my business cards. Believe it or not, I give to patients, so I'll give it to you, 253 509 8880. I'm always available. And as for me, you can contact me, your everyday medicine at gmail.com, your everyday medicine at gmail.com, or at everyday med on Twitter. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this is some ASAP Frontline. <laughs>